Well, good morning again, everybody. I'm back here, and uh, I'm really delighted to welcome Dan Helfrich, Chairman and CEO of Deloitte Consulting. Before his current role, Dan led the government and public services team at Deloitte, and he has more than two decades of experience in helping businesses transform and increase their efficiency and effectiveness. Thanks for being here, Dan. It's great to be here, Anish. Great. So today we will be speaking with Dan about leading and navigating change in cybersecurity landscape. I will try to include as many questions, and if you don't have a QR code for submitting your questions on Pigeonhole, which is this particular iPad that I'll be watching <laughs> every now and then, then please just raise your hand and we'll have somebody get you uh, one of those cards so that you can actually submit questions. But let me start with some other questions that I have prepared for you, Dan. Uh, so, you know, in times of disruption, and tremendous volatility from a CEO perspective. Is there a playbook that CEOs use to be able to navigate, and especially in digital transformation that is constantly taking place? Well, first, and it's great to be here. And you said something in your intro earlier that uh, GW is a place that creates leaders for the moment. And I would attest to that as one of the biggest uh, employers, proudly, of graduates from George Washington. We're thrilled by the impact that your former students are having at Deloitte. Uh, look, when people ask me about playbooks for CEOs, I'll be honest, they scare me, the idea of a playbook. Um, because the idea of a playbook for me suggests that one can predict the sequence of events and therefore the sequence of actions that a leader can take in moments of disruption. And I've found both in advising CEOs and in being one myself now for going on five years, that there are ingredients that one needs to have as a leader to navigate the moment. But the notion that there is a step-by-step -step playbook is foolhardy. And so the ingredients for me really boil down to two. One is diversity, diversity of voices at the table. And when I say diversity, Am I talking about race and ethnicity? Yes. Am I talking about um, gender? Yes. But I'm also talking about experience diversity. You know, when I form a team, I like to have people who've grown up at Deloitte, who've only been there a year, who spent time in government, who spent time in academia. That's diversity. I like to have people that think about things from an organizational behavior standpoint and from a security standpoint and from a customer experience standpoint. So that's the diversity piece. And then agility is probably self-evident, but uh, if, if you think about uh, being a CEO in a moment where a pandemic happens, no one handed any of us a playbook and said, here's what happens when you do that. And, and right now, no one has handed a CEO a playbook and said, there's a rapid, as Ken, I think, described well, this rapid evolution of generative AI that could impact everything for how you run your company or government and how you interact with customers and citizens, there's no playbook for that. But diversity plus agility gives you the best chance. So that's a great answer, Dan. Of course, in my case, that is why I'm not a CEO, because I got a whole manual for deanship, and I've gone through <laughs> half of it, so I'm still working on it. How are it. you doing? Uh, well, I don't know. Ask them. <laughs> so, but. But let me ask you, in broader digital transformation efforts, where does cybersecurity fit in? And um, you know, why is it important? Well, first of all, if there's one message I, I, I want to get across to this audience is that digital transformation and cyber do not sit side by side. They sit together. And I think it's been one of the biggest realizations for companies and governments over the last five years is there have been major mistakes made when companies pursue a digital transformation agenda. And then there's a cyber team working over here um, in the CIO and CISO's office. And then those two teams will talk every once in a while, and they progress on parallel paths. No, digital transformation must have security and privacy built in from the get-go. Because if, if you were to ask me, what's the primary currency of business today? And, and I would argue the primary currency of a relationship between 
a government and, and its citizens as well. It's trust. Trust is the primary currency of business today. And those brands that build trust with employees and with customers have, you know, we've, we've studied in a lot of different ways, have like a two and a half X performance advantage uh, over those who do not. Fundamentally, how do you build trust? Well, one of the ways is when you are transforming digitally, you embed security in the way you think about the design from moment one, not as an appendage. So that's a great answer, and I love it. But um, you know, in our conversation earlier, I, if I recall correctly, you had mentioned that you used to play soccer. And to use a sports analogy, as the team captain of a large organization, how do you balance the competing demands of protecting your data and also the need for innovation and the growth that needs to come with it? So I, I guess the premise of the question I would challenge a little bit in I'm used why, to that. Do the, why do those, why do we set that up as competing demands? I think when we talk like that, then we're setting up this conversation for, I've got the security and compliance people over here and they're trying to thwart innovation. And I have the business folks over here who are trying to propel it. Well, if we're trying to get the smartest people in the world to build security and that kind of thinking, then if we set it up as your anti-innovation over here, who wants to go do that? No one wants to go do, no one wants to go do that. So now, how do you set it up? Well, you have, to, you have to design things smartly. So you have to think about how do I create minimum viable products in a sandbox environment that allow me to practice before things get into full production and get to face the, you know, the broader world. You have to do, and Kent references, you have to do red teaming where you anticipate what bad actors might do in various scenarios and how you would, and how you would respond to it. So I don't, view them as, I don't view them as competing. Now, an example of how I think you set the tone differently as a CEO, We've come from a world where typically, if you're in a company or a government, you, you might have a mandatory training on technology. You might have a mandatory training on AI. And then you get a, have to do a mandatory training on security, compliance training. Well, why are those two separate trainings? Mm -hmm. If we're going to have a conversation and train people about artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. why is the cyber education not built into that fundamentally? That, to me, is how you make sure that it's not competing. So then that was a question that you didn't like because it was generated by ChatGPT. <laughs> so let me ask you and change the topic to ChatGPT and say, you know, in recent rise in ChatGPT, you know, at an academia and higher education, we have had faced some ethical questions, yeah. but there's also a lot of, you know, excitement and opportunity. From your perspective, is, do you see ChatGPT as a force for good? I do. Um, and let's, let's, let's talk about generative AI with ChatGPT being one instantiation yeah. of, uh, you know, of generative AI. It is a force for good because the world can learn at a more rapid pace and people can get answers and uh, new products can be developed at a more rapid pace. But any force for good, particularly a force for good, that is new has the risk of becoming uh, uh, in some ways unintentionally and in some ways intentionally a force for evil. And so what we're spending a lot of time on right now is how you harness the good and how you create a dialogue and an infrastructure that manages the potential downside risk. And so, you know, we've built this Institute for AI Ethics, for example, because we think the scholarship and the dialogue about um, ethics needs to evolve as quickly as the technology does, right? And this is where scholarship and research and academia, if there's one fear I have, it's that the pace of 
research and scholarship and evolution does not keep pace with the evolution of the capabilities of the technology. Because if that happens, mm -hmm. then we will always be two and three steps behind relative to the technology. And that is a recipe for good losing in some cases to uh, less good. Great, so I've gotten many questions already here and, and I'll try and combine a couple of them because they're all around the similar topics of how will Deloitte merge AI technologies and other new technologies with their consulting services? And um, maybe I'll read another one so that you can combine and see yeah. the sense here. And, and how is Deloitte AI Institute playing a role in attacking cybersecurity risks? What is this institute looking to do beyond the first installment of AI? Yeah, well, so take a step back. Why does the profession of consulting exist, Anoush? Um, it, it's an existential question that many of us consultants have pondered and we try to, you know, our parents and family members ask us what we do and we say consulting and they say, oh, so you are I think a, it sounds you're cool. a CIA operative and you don't know what to, um, how, how, how to describe what you do. And uh, the truth is the profession exists to help governments and companies navigate change. Mm -hmm. That is why the profession exists. And the theory of the profession is that we can be ahead of the change and have expertise to help clients navigate it at faster rates that they can do on their own. So how are we incorporating generative AI into our services? In every way, mm -hmm. because it presents this remarkable opportunity for change. So, so let's talk about the ways that it potentially offers uh, a consumer company to change. Well, it impacts the way that you create customer experiences for, uh, for your customers to allow them to interact with chatbots and to navigate and create custom experiences. It also affects the way you run your company. Mm -hmm. So think about a topic like knowledge management. Every company has an intranet, right? And most companies are fundamentally dissatisfied with their intranets. I can't find any content, et cetera. Well, uh, a, a private, secure instance of a generative AI technology running on your data in your systems, that can fundamentally change knowledge management at your company. And so our job, is to see those potential futures and then to build solutions that allow companies and governments to, to achieve that value quicker. That's what we're doing. And then the, the second question referenced the AI Institute. Well, again, as we do that, how do we make sure that we are a beacon for good relative to ethics and the trustworthiness of that technology? We've got to train our people every one of our people so they show up with that mindset. So as we incorporate these new technologies on behalf of our clients, that is done in an ethical way. So I'm gonna follow up later on about this institute with you because we at GW are also very much interested in trustworthy AI and, and, and our engineering school particularly is, uh, is, is really working hard on that aspect. So there may be good, good collaboration there. But let me, let me take you back to your days when you were leading the government and public services team at Deloitte. Can you share some insights on the role of private-public partnerships, particularly as it pertains to really um, you know, enhancing cybersecurity policies and strategies? Yeah, look, um, I, I actually, there, there, there tends to be a negative, um, at times cynical view of public-private partnerships. Uh, having been in this town for you know, 25 years, if I compare 25 years ago to today, I actually have a very optimistic view of public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. I, I think the degree of information sharing, the degree of um, leader appreciation that it's actually the intersection of government insight and private sector perspective and academia is required to solve uh, you know, the biggest issues. I, I think we've moved a ton on that. Now, as it relates to cyber, um, one of the most interesting things in cyber, and you'll have guests throughout the day is, 
some of, and some might argue, a disproportionate amount of the best talent in cyber is in the government. And uh, we, in, in my mind, don't recognize that enough. And the fountain of knowledge, both in offensive and defensive cyber, that comes from people who've been um, thinking about not only the standards and frameworks for cybersecurity that can be used by the private sector, but who've been combating threats on behalf of the United States for a long time, their, that talent is incredibly important to incorporate into all the decisions we make. So I'm, I'm an optimist as it relates to the current state of public-private partnership. So, so for just going a little bit deeper, and we'll be having Senator Warner later on today, mm -hmm. and we'll probably be talking to him about some regulations and policies and also in many of our panels. So you mentioned there's been a negative view. Um, from your lens, could you speak to how CEOs are concerned um, or are supportive of the policies around AI and cyber? Perhaps um, not you, but in general. No, in, in general, look, I, I had a conversation with a CEO yesterday who most of you would know, and all of you would know the company, and this was a, you know, this was a topic of conversation. Uh, I would broadly characterize that there is a acceptance that thoughtful regulation is a competitive advantage for the United States, and that in areas of emerging technology, there is thoughtful regulation that needs to emerge and develop. The concern, it goes back to my first point, the concern is about the agility of the regulation and the agility of the policy to evolve as the technology rapidly evolves. And I think a lot of CEOs would say it has not been a hallmark of regulators, not just domestically, but around the world, to create agile policy and mm -hmm. agile regulation. Some might say, might even call it oxymoronic you know, to even use those terms together. That, I think, is the challenge that sits in front of regulators and legislators today. Um, but I, I believe the mentality of people like the senator uh, is pointed in the right direction. But agility is the name of the game as regulations and policies are developed. So let me follow up, because there's a question which kind of points to that, which is talking about how can one begin to undo the bias held by business innovators uh, regarding the serious and necessary cybersecurity risks short of an incident. And often you're talking about policies and regulations, and oftentimes they're informed because something happened. How can we stay ahead of the curve? Well, I, I, I love that point. And frankly, the part of uh, my business that I hope disappears over time is the massive incident review and uh, mitigation, right? Where something big happens and a third party like us gets hired to say what went wrong and, you know, I hope that business goes away. Because if that business goes away, that means that we've created institutions and frameworks that are more resilient, uh, you know, fr from the beginning. So, you know, the questioner talked about the bias that one has sort of against that CEO, let me, go back to the, let me go back to the diversity point I made at the outset, which is part of the way you do it is when you design a management team, have you thoughtfully made sure that the experiences of the people at the table include not just a CISO or a CIO that has experience with security, but other roles, because if you do, then in the natural course of decision making as a management team, you will see security and trust considerations embedded in the choices made, as opposed to it, the, the business people talk about what they want, and then at the end of the conversation, they say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Chief Information Security Officer, do you have anything to add? Mm -hmm. That's a bad moment, because we've treated security as an appendage. It has to be embedded throughout. So that's complex for smaller organizations or startups where they are thinking about the resources that are necessary to do that. Would that be accurate to say? I think so, though, if, 
if the fine educational institutes of this country are creating well-rounded business leaders and innovators, then what will happen is the startups will be founded by people who are driven by innovation but understand the importance of trust and security. So it's basically up to you, Anush. Yeah, all right. So I got my work cut out. Yeah. I will read the rest of the manual on Dean, uh, uh, Dean's job. But so let me, let me ask you, how do you see the disruptive technologies um, like AI impacting jobs in the future of work? Oftentimes, you know, people are talking about They're Dean's scared job. of the robots. Yes. Yeah, look. Should we be scared of the robots? No, you should be proud that um, for centuries, um, technology has been an enabler of human progress. And despite, you can go back centuries and look at incredible moments in each industrial revolution, et cetera, where the fear was that the role of the human was less important and employment would suffer. And none of those macro moments have happened. There's micro moments as the economy of just, and why not? Because the, what the technology is doing is enabling higher level human thought and decision making. And, uh, but what needs to happen is the humans need to evolve in what their skill set is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that takes resilience and it takes intent. But uh, we absolutely see an incredible future for knowledge workers, for um, people who are understanding the context of data and insight that's being generated by technology and how to apply it. And look, the, the, we talk a lot about, you, you've asked a few questions about transformation. Well, why do transformations succeed or fail? when you interview executives to talk about it, it boils down to change management and organizational behavior and have the humans adopted and adjusted to the transformation. Well, humans are at the center of all of that. And so skills like organizational change management will take on even a higher order importance as we go forward. So that's great. So let me ask you, there's a question here, which is you mentioned about the education part of it and how I'm now responsible for the real world here. Um, there are also folks who have grown up when, um, and they are in responsible positions in the Department of Defense or in companies where they didn't grow up with this technology. So is there a need for their retraining and their return to education to really get a grasp of um, what today's uh, technological transformation there is? There absolutely is. Uh, and part of retraining is staying current with the body of knowledge and, and skill set that one needs to navigate the moment. So is there a retraining in the classical sense that's required? Yes. But part of retraining, Anuj, is getting out of the ivory tower and spending time with people of every generation, every level in your organization, because that is the better teacher. So one of the things as I map out my day and week and month and year that I make sure is that I'm spending more time with people in their 20s on my team than I am with people in their 50s. Mm -hmm. And I do that for a lot of reasons. One is to stay um, young mentally. but. The other reason is I learn more, truly. Mm -hmm. I learn more from the perspective of those folks than I do from people who have backgrounds and experiences that look like mine. If more leaders adopted that mentality, then some of the biases and concerns that have been expressed will be mitigated because people will be retrained not just from an academic sense, but from a mentality sense. And the retraining of the mentalities of government leaders and corporate leaders is unbelievably important to our future. 
That's great. So let me, let me ask you one final question then. And I think um, Provost Bracey asked Kent Walker this question on what keeps him awake at night. And um, I'm going to not phrase it like that. I'm going to ask you, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see, particularly in, um, in, uh, in cybersecurity and AI space? And what is Deloitte doing to pursue them? I, I think we've talked about most of them. Look, the, the opportunity is to innovate for good at a faster rate than we've ever innovated before. And, uh, and if you do that with an ethical frame, then progress will be the outcome. And so that's the way I think about it. That's the way we think about it. And again, we happen to have this incredible um, privilege to have a platform, given who we are as a company, to work with almost every one of the most influential companies and governments. Uh, and so I, I take that responsibility incredibly seriously. Uh, and let's see what we together can do to, to harness that power, but harness it for good. Dan, it's been a pleasure talking Thanks to you. Sir. Really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much. And now, please, yes, let's give him a round of applause here, please. Thank you very much. <laughs>